So we are discussing a brilliant essay written by Dr. Christina Peterson titled Apostles and Revolution, Biblical Studies and Marxism. We genuinely think this is a much needed and necessary Marxist intervention in particular into the field of biblical studies. And so we hope you will check out the essay um, we linked in the show notes and we'll bring it to your friends, bring it to your uh, pastors and ministers, your priests, bring it to fellow church people and definitely seminarians or, or maybe even slide it into a professor's desk. We find this essay to be much needed and a phenomenal contribution to the field of biblical studies. Now, we also have some serious critiques of the first half of the essay and in conversation with uh, Dr. Peterson, we all decided to not dive into the ideological differences to which Chris and I subscribe and Dr. Peterson subscribes. And this is actually important because the first third, first half of the essay is on what Marxism is and its historical development. So if you're interested, stick around after the conversation and Chris and I will rehash Again, everything that we love about this essay, um, which is the vast, vast majority of it, and then also what we think Dr. Peterson gets wrong. So, all right. Having said that, I hope you all enjoy this phenomenal conversation with Dr. Christina Peterson. All right, friends. Chase and I are tickled pink to have our friend Christina with us today to talk about her excellent, excellent essay, Apostles of Revolution, Marxism and Biblical Studies. Uh, And she's going to talk with us about um, the relationship between Marxism and the Bible. So let's just jump right in. Uh, Christina, first, would you kind of tell us who you are and the work you're up to? And then our first question for you, and you can jump into this as you feel ready, is what were you generally hoping to do with this essay? So take it away. Hi everyone, and um, thanks very much to Chase and Chris for inviting me. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, so I'm my name's Christina Pedersen. I'm an independent scholar. Um, I have connections with both Denmark and Australia, and travel a bit here and there. Obviously, not so much during the current pandemic, but uh, but otherwise, I'm I'm all over the place, and I work both in biblical studies and in 18th century history. But uh, my focus is usually religion and um, and how it sort of can uh, be part of or, or interact with social change. So uh, what I was hoping to accomplish with the essay is a, well, it's a good it's a, a good question because I mean I was invited to write it um, and when I saw the format I thought oh 100 pages I get into the nitty-gritty of a, a given perspective in relation to the Bible and I thought it was a, a really good opportunity to provide a good overview without losing sight of a complicated history. Um, and it also gave me uh, a really good chance to think through some things and gather my thoughts, um, mainly on history, which is important to biblical studies. And I think of that mainly as a as a historical discipline. And I mean, obviously, I guess I had some kind of political agenda. But to be honest, I mean, I, I finished I wrote this essay in 2019. I submitted it in the final version, January 2020. And, you know, as we know, the world is just you know, wow, I mean, what has happened the last two years. So anything that might have been planned at that point is gone. But I guess a shakeup of biblical studies was probably what I had in mind at some level. Um, Yeah, and that is exactly what you accomplished with this essay. Uh, You know, Christina, we've said multiple times before, emailing back and forth, I, I think this is a very needed and necessary intervention into the field of biblical, but also theological studies in general. It's fascinating. Um, and it's something like I, I've been looking for for a long time. And it, but it's it's just so simple. Uh, for folks who have a historical materialist analysis of the world and of class struggle, but it it probably seems so kind of out of the ordinary if you're unfamiliar with Marxism. And I think you do a great job introducing 
uh, your readers to historical materialism and uh, class analysis. So really, really um, loved your essay. And in the essay, you argue that the field of biblical studies is itself a product of class struggle, right? Struggle between particular nations, bourgeois and proletarian classes, between imperialist powers and the rest of the world, and between colonizing and colonized nations. So can you introduce us to the ways in which these material and ideological struggles have fundamentally shaped the field of biblical studies? Yeah, wow, yeah. Uh... Yes. So, so yeah, biblical studies, I mean, the, the, the scholarly field of biblical studies is a, a, an academic discipline. And it might sound sort of a, a bit excessive to say that such a tiny discipline should be affected by large historical shifts. Um, but from a Marxist perspective, it is, of course, inescapable that uh, that class struggle, um, of, co- of course, it will manifest itself in, in biblical studies. <laughs> um, so uh, I have uh, some examples and one is not from the article, um, but it came in a paper I heard by a, by a really good uh, PhD student in Australia called Matthew King. And he was looking at the treatment of the Bible in the work of two German philosophers. And one is a 20th century Jewish Marxist German Ernst Bloch. Um, and the other one um, is uh, Nietzsche, uh, you know, 19th century uh, German philosopher. And uh, and so Nietzsche is, of course, the more well-known of the two and famous for the God is dead and so on. But King shows that Nietzsche was really taken with uh, the affirmative religion, uh, which is the product of the ruling class warriors and kings over against the negative religion, which is what the oppressed uh, classes represent uh, through the prophets. And, um, and Nietzsche then regards this whole understanding of religion in the Bible as a falsification of the message in favor of, uh, of the poor and weak. And I think I mean, pe- some people will know this, but some people won't. And so I'm just sort of going through it. And and so Nietzsche thinks that there is a natural inequality um, in the Bible, which is then overridden by a manufactured equality, which is propagated then through socialism um, and spread through Europe. Uh, and so suppresses this uh, original spirit with which he sees Jesus as the manifestation of and that Jesus' disciples then sort of tame it and uh, or tame the spirit and and mis- misunderstand him completely and and made him stand for the opposite of what the point was. And so, I think that's where you see uh, uh, you see a quite clear class line in Nietzsche's um, understanding of the Bible. And Bloch also has a, a, a differentiates between the Bible of the church and of the people, but that's, he sees the God of Exodus as leading the oppressed out of bondage um, and living in communal ownership in the desert. And for Bloch, the prophets uh, represent this particular stream over against the more sort of creator God on high to which people are small and beholden. Um, and so the prophets preach this return to the God of Exodus, a God of the poor. And for Bloch, Jesus is a revolutionary figure who sought to build the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I, I think Matthew's analysis is really powerful. And but because Nietzsche is one of the most influential philosophers of the 19th century, and he and he's really benefited from a downplaying of these deeply reactionary aristocratic mm. uh, elements and they've only recently been exposed in, a, in an excellent book by the late Do- Domenico Lasurdo and so if we can classify this under biblical studies then I think this is a good example of how class affiliation and politics sort of inform our readings. Mm. I have a second uh, example which is not quite as long uh, so that's uh, taken from the article itself and this is the point that Norman Gottwald uh, the Canadian biblical scholar makes that namely that the interpretive choices that biblical scholars make are always expressions of vested interest and um, he notes that biblical scholars are reluctant to address questions of poverty as something not natural because this would um, mean that one ultimately would have to reflect on one's own position in a long, long chain, uh, chain of exploitation. And um, 
So there are fields that are not studied because they connect to issues of class. And instead, there's a focus on ind individuals, Jesus or Paul or, or social or political structures, which remove focus of exploitation, trade instead of agriculture, Roman Empire. Um, and, and the focus on Roman Empire uh, also fails to address the fact that there are classes which have always benefited enormously from occupation. And so anti-imperialist struggles can and do mask internal class struggles, even in, in biblical studies. And so the Bible itself is, as the as these examples uh, point out, um, also a, pro uh, a product of class struggle. Yeah, so if I may, that was really, really helpful. And I hear you saying, you know, whether you're Nietzsche or James Cone, right, MLK, uh, Christina, Chris or Chase, we are living in, we are raised in, we are shaped by the class struggles of our particular nations and then the class struggles that are happening on a global level. And these are both material struggles. Classes have different materialist interests, um, right? And But then there are also ideological struggles. And one thing that really stuck out to me in your essay is um, early on you is you name the the class struggles between kind of communist ideology, which has a particular um, analysis of of how we are organized and how certain people are treated, right? And then there's uh, liberalism, right? Liberalism um, is not outside of class struggle. It's not outside of social or political tension in war. And and I think that's I think that's really really important to. Uh, to understand how our interpretations, whether it was an interpretation of an early Christian theologian in the fourth century or an interpretation by an evangelical in the United States in 2022, right? All of our interpretations, uh, before we even get to like the analysis of what was really happening in all the different contexts that the Bible mm. was, you know, the library, that is the Bible that was written, mm. um, our interpretations are deeply shaped if not primarily shaped by the class struggles of our context. Yep, absolutely. And another, I think, one thing I really wanted to name before we move on was that in your text, you also name that the communist revolutions of the 19th and 20th century, and I would say, and I would argue, continuing into the 21st century as well, these have greatly shaped biblical studies as well. So, so the struggles between the imperial powers in the rest of the world, right? These anti-colonial nationalist struggles mm. that, that just define the 20th century, but also the proletarian revolutions that we saw in Russia, in mm. China, these fundamentally shaped, whether people are aware of it or not, yep. people like Karl Barth, uh, Paul Tillich, you know, does, does anyone n name a theologian and they've been <laughs> fundamentally shaped by struggles happening in other nations as well. Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is a, a definitely a, a very important point, and because one of the things I also wanted to to bring out is precisely how um, we have internal struggles of the international communist movement are connected with world events, and then um, I've tried to organize it in in terms of you know the the four international movements, which is the organization of the of the uh, socialist working class, and and the big upheavals. Uh, we see are around the uh, establishment of the German Empire in 1871, and then the the First World War in the early 20th century, Russian Revolution, Second World War, and and that's where we have these big four organizations of the socialist workers uh, movements, and and they establish themselves and break up at various points, and and I mean in hindsight we can see that that um, a significant breaking point is. When do you make the decision to align yourself with the powers that be? And so that's when then they then split up again and then reorganize um, without that group that has then uh, sort of somehow decided to uh, to uh, align themselves with um, with the powers that be. And I think this is particularly um, pertinent in the in the second international which went from 1889 to 1916, which split due to the First World War into a, an anti-imperialist war faction and a nationalist pro-war faction. Um, and, and this pressure from the liberal conservative powers had, had consequences within the international socialist movement and, and, and kind of, you know, broke the internationalism of that movement by, by um, introducing national struggles. 
and and you mentioned liberalism yeah because i mean liberalism well as, and i think this is where we also need to clarify because usually in the us it means something else than or or at least has a different sort of um flavor than it does in in europe and so when i say liberalism i mean the ideology of the individual um which you know is a extremely ahistorical and universalizing and and also has a particular view on religion as a purely private individual matter um and and these have all been been the ruling ideas of biblical interpretation and i think any focus on social context revolt community etc have been exceptions up until the 1970s as a as james crossley uh, has has demonstrated Yeah, and, and if I may, before we move on, I, mm. I think it was a great example, right? You're talking about the individualism of liberalism, mm. the individualist conception of history. And an example would be, hmm, well, how did the like, Abrahamic faith come to be? What what was the primary drive for its its practices and its perspectives on life? Well, maybe a liberal perspective might say, well, Abraham. Abraham's <laughs> exactly. ideas, right? Yeah. The great yeah. man, the individual, or you yeah. know, maybe they'll find some other uh, male, female. It doesn't matter. Just an individual, or just a small group of people, and they say, "Well, that's why they said this, they did this, they practiced this." Um, yeah. But obviously, a historical materialist perspective says, "No, there were class struggles happening across the. I don't know. I think the scriptures were written like over like at least a thousand years. It was a really, really long span. Mm, mm, mm. Um, ancient texts, and they were oral before, right? So, anyways, that's that's a uh, You're going to lead. You're going to be led to very different conceptions of what was happening, why, what was said, why. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and uh, one of the so one of the really interesting figures in all of this is is Karl Kautsky, um, because he you know was he wrote you know Foundations of Christianity and Forerunners of modern of modern socialism, which you know included a a, a volume on um, on early Christianity right up to the Anabaptists and. Uh, And uh, he ended up uh, taking sides in the in the pro-war camp, and um, so just um, taking the side of the bourgeoisie, and opted for a more reformist line, um, in line with the social democrats, and and which today would probably be called la labor parties, and and so part of this rift in the second international. Um, but another important thing is also that biblical studies in Northern Europe were and are training ground for Uh, ministers in the state churches. And so the kind of studies that are carried out in biblical studies are, of course, framed within the bubble of the liberal state and sort of serve to to, to support its institutions. And, and, I, and I know that's different in, in both the U.S. and the U.K. Um, but again, this brings us back to the, the point about interpret interpretative choices <laughs> and vested interests, because the Bible itself is a product of class struggle with With both reactionary and revolutionary streams, the choice scholars make are also important. And like you say, you can opt for either focusing on Abraham as the individual, or Job is also a very a very popular um, text in the Hebrew Bible because it is this individual sort of um, male uh, with a, the sort of wisdom stream and uh, the agonizing male through I don't know how many chapters, but uh, yeah. <laughs> That's an excellent point. And I would say, well, while, yeah, we don't have a state church in the United States, yeah. we do have a state church. Um, we, could, we could call it like a neo-colonized church or a <laughs> imperialized church. But yeah, ministers still are trained to be tools of the state. Yeah. Uh, that continues on. I yeah. Think. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, you spend a lot of time in this essay, Christina explaining what Marxism just is, um, which was really cool to hear a person who's interested in the Bible even do that. Uh, and another thing you did was, let's just say you called out some of the heavy hitters in biblical studies. Um, so I was clapping the whole time. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, while Lenin was conscious of and waged ideological class struggle within the internationalist communist movement and within the party in particular, It was Mao that fleshed out and explained to a great degree the ways in which class struggle in society will inevitably produce class struggle within the party and within the international communist movement. In what ways has class struggle internal to the historical international communist movement 
influenced biblical studies? And why is understanding the development of communist theory and struggle and grasping the correct line critical for biblical studies? Mm. Yeah, so I think I probably would refer back to what I was saying earlier about how all of these various grouping and regrouping of the various socialist organizations in the four internationals were impacted by world events and so then themselves had massive social impacts and that filters through to like chase what you were saying earlier as well with all the the theologians and um Karl Barth and Tillich and uh, and and Moltmann and so on I mean so all of these these people are completely impacted by these events and um and that has a also an impact on how it's you know, uh, received and, and, and discussed within the discipline of biblical studies. And I think James Crossley in the article I mentioned just earlier, it was on the, um, it was on the sort of social scientific criticism in, in biblical studies in the, in the 20th century, which is practically non-existent. And it all seemed to sort of fade away after the, the Russian revolution. And because before that people like Friedrich Engels and, um, and Kautsky were, were quite influential in biblical studies, not so much as setting the agenda, but at least being forces that you had to reckon with. You know, you couldn't get it. You at least had to discuss with them or uh, uh, argue with them uh, when you were making your points. But that sort of just completely disappeared after after the 1920s and uh, and didn't really come back uh, in, until 1970 in a sort of new revamped um, anti-Marxist kind of social agenda. Yeah, so we see how these political developments sort of impact the field of, of biblical studies in a sort of oblique way, I guess, and set the parameters for which interpretations are acceptable or or not even fashionable, but, but sort of morally and politically acceptable. Um, and I, I wonder whether the importance of the correct line in this, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I know that I probably hint about it in, in the article, but, but I think, you know, in the wisdom of the past two years, um, I think the, um, I think I now think that um, the importance of understanding at what has been at stake and how much the intertwining with the world has had um, an impact is, is the most important and 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 I think this also removes by focusing on the entanglement of biblical studies with social and political events also removes the discipline from its secluded and protected sphere and and sort of emphasizes it as a product of, of social struggle and uh, and I think that that whether or not the correct sort of party line is 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 established there is probably not so important to me anymore um, I think we have bigger bigger fish to fry. I think one of the things I walked away with uh, from your essay was that at least uh, on one hand, it really does matter whether you think Bernstein and Kotsky uh, were correct in their understanding of class and their understanding of ideology and the, the political programs that they were uh, putting forth, because that bleeds into the biblical interpretations and the, and uh, that, you know, the, that Kotsky in particular would produce, right? The political mm. kinds of programs that Christians would adopt for themselves, or at least, you know, cause we're not just doing uh, political education at the workshop or in a, a secret reading mm. group or, um, on the streets, we're also doing it in the church. Mm. And, and I think at the beginning of the episode, you had mentioned something about whether you were aware or not of your political intention behind this essay. But, mm. you know, as Marx says, there is always a political character to everything that we do and, and say. And, and I think um, it's just really important to understand that every single commentary that a listener right now has on their shelf or um, mm. has on the shelf in the library mm. that mm. they go to has political implications, has mm. material implications for the masses of laboring people. And so it is actually really important to understand, yep. well, when this person talks about class, what do they mean by class? And that's something mm. that we've done on Faith and Capital for the last three years. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. um, I remember when I first got really interested in Marxism, I, mean, I was I was just diving into every single book I could get at the library. And I was really disappointed generally because mm. 
as I continued to study class from a Marxist lens, uh, history and ideology from a Marxist lens, I couldn't find any biblical scholars or theologians who either, you know, didn't full out reject Marxism or just actually just failed to understand it, right? Maybe they, yeah, yeah. they attempted, but there was a general lack of understanding. So yeah, I, I think um, that really stood out and that was a really important point. Yeah, thanks. Can I just say something that one of the challenges also was that, you know, there might be people who, who uh, sound Marxist, but who don't sort of flag themselves as Marxist and sort of probably wouldn't be super keen on being sort of, you know, outed as a Marxist if they didn't do it themselves. And so that was really sort of a challenge in, in writing this to try and sort of balance balance that that uh, sensitivity. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. So. From a Marxist Leninist Maoist perspective, you know, everyone on the everyone listening in knows that that is the political ideology that Chris and I subscribe to. So um, 45 years after capitalism's defeat of the world's second, you know, world historical socialist revolution led by the Chinese Communist Party, after 40 years of neoliberalism, 30 years after the imperialist powers declared the end of history, and in a present moment where your um, imperialism is in crisis, more and more biblical scholars are once again attempting to use Marxist analysis and uh, to some extent historical materialism for the purposes of understanding the mm. numerous contexts in which the scriptures, right, this whole mm. library we call the scriptures, were produced. So mm. in your essay, you demonstrate how biblical texts are products of class struggle, right? Not just biblical studies from an interpretive mm. side, but the actual biblical texts. Mm. So how can a historical materialist analysis of a society's mode of production or its economic base, which consists of productive forces, right? The, the technology, materials, the, you know, the actual workers ourselves and productive relations, the actual class struggle or cl class structure through which goods and services are produced. Mm. How can how can uh, historical materialism aid the field of biblical studies in understanding the correct um, or the context and theology of a given book of the Bible? And then also, could you give us an example of how biblical texts are products of class struggle? Mm, 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 yeah, thank you. Um, oh, this is just this. This is just so much fun. Thanks. <laughs> so, I yeah, mean, the, it is for the, us too. It is for <laughs> us too. So. The, the Bible is just such a powerful um, cultural text and sort of that, yeah, as you say, the, the library of the Bible um, for the Christian world and, and has shaped its cultures and histories in a way that we can never, ever fully understand. But the Bible of, say, the fifth century is not the same uh, Bible that we sit with today. And, you know, this is an obvious point, but it still sort of um, is worth repeating. Uh, and I think a, a historical materialist analysis of the Bible um, can help us understand how the Bible moves along with the economy. Um, and there are there are ways that to see this. For example, I mentioned translations of the biblical texts which incorporate capitalist terminology and thus effectively update the text. Um, uh, I have an example from 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 26 through 9, where the Hebrew text speaks of Solomon as gathering together chariots and riders and taking his horses out of Egypt at a price. And so in the new in international version, this becomes accumulate, import and export. And these are, of course, all, you know, modern themes from our present socioeconomic organization. And another sort of translation, which also sort of serves to sort of am ameliorate, but also sort of remove the the text from its from its context, is the translation of of slaves as servants, for example. Um, but you know, we might we might get back to that. But examples of of a text as a product of of class struggle. I mean, you. You can, on the one hand, get alerted to this through the passionate responses of biblical interpreters, um, you know, when they're saying like, this is not the case and this is certainly not the case. And you think, oh, well, maybe that is the case and uh, sort of start digging, you know, when they get really sore about something, you realize that, that you know, this is something worth pursuing. Um, but I think uh, I'd like to draw attention here to the Acts of the Apostles. And, and this example is based on the, the work of Jennifer Glancy. Um, who uh, 
who noticed that the book of Acts is written from a slaveholder's perspective. Um, and so she traces all of the Hebrew Bible texts on slavery and liberation and notices that they've all been selected or sort of um, um, uh, framed so that they avoid any any talk of liberation. And and um, and she also notes that the conversions in the narrative take place at the will of the householder and includes his slaves. And the slaves generally in the text are either referred to in a passive voice. For example, the eunuch in, in chapter eight is is what was carried and it doesn't say by whom or whatever. It just was carried um, or there or the slaves communication is is reported in a passive rather than active voices. And so Rhoda in chapter 12 went in and told the others that Peter was at the gate. Um, and so to. To expand on this, I've, in my own work, I've sort of looked at how the active characters and acts are are um, are all men, and uh, especially Roman officials, uh, which I also found was quite interesting. And finally, acts also shows preference for the city, I mean the polis, over against the entire territory surrounding and nourishing the cities. And so. Acts does, I think, uh, portray a ruling class perspective, um, which is not to say that it was produced by someone from from the ruling class, but certainly someone with ruling class alle allegiances and and pretensions. Yeah. So, you know, if someone was um, by class, right, we mean how one relates to the process of production and distribution of goods and services, right? Yep. From yep. a Marxist perspective. And so where you are situated in the class structure of a particular society, and as you're naming, the Book of Acts was produced in a slave society. So if slaves are producing spiritual texts for slaves, for other slaves, then, you know, that's going to be a bit different than, say, masters are producing mm. a spiritual religious text for masters, or mm. if masters are producing spiritual religious text for slaves. Mm. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everything, say, that that the slave scriptures for slave community um, will be liberative uh, because as we know, I mean, we live in the United States. Um, we are overwhelmingly workers, but mm. we have internalized petty bourgeois ideology, mm, mm. bourgeois ideology. We celebrate, mm. we glorify, we, we, we long to become our oppressors and our exploiters. Mm. Mm. And so that, I think that's a great example of how a biblical text <laughs> Um, the authors and also the audience, you know, all of that matters, their class composition and also the ideology, whether they have, mm -mm. whether they're um, committed to their own class interests or mm. perhaps mm. they're in a subordinated class and they've internalized mm. the ideology of their uh, mm. dominators, their exploiters, their oppressors. Mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. I keep jumping ahead to interpretation with a community, my community in particular. I'm thinking damn, reading the Bible is really dangerous. Oh my God. It is a, uh, these, these insights are not things that, that people in the pews have, which is uh, tough for me to think about. As I gave a sermon this morning on a text that most people probably, if they just picked up their Bible and read it, would have no idea what it was saying. Yeah. Um, Chris, why, just to, you know, just to make that clear, why is that the case? Why are the majority of the people, you know, even listening to this podcast perhaps are, but but especially people in the church pews, say, particularly in the United States, why are they unaware of the material interests mm. of the class struggle within our own country? Mm. There are a lot of good ways to answer that, but class struggle <laughs> is where it begins, right? Yeah, exactly. There, in general, um, I would say that this emphasis that primarily lives in the United States, but is in other places, I understand that the ability to read the Bible exists within each individual. So the remnants of liberalism yeah, and also this um, divine inspiration that even the community doesn't actually need to, to understand much about the history or the context of where things were written, because um, God will God will show you how to read it in the moment. Now, there are times when even that can be liberative, like think about the hush harbors where there is no, there's no theological seminary for slaves to be trained in how to read the Bible. Mm. Um, but, but yet this, this emphasis that both Chase and I grew up with that, that you really don't need to actually try to understand, um, you just need to read the scriptures. And we thought that what was happening was God was showing the community how to read and mm. understand. What was really happening is, is we were unable to 
to access any of the anti um, imperial, which we've mm. named the the anti anti wealth at least teachings mm. of Jesus, mm. as in anything other than gentle correctives, like maybe mm. don't don't be crazy rich, okay, and be nice to poor people, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, we missed out on a lot, and that was that was by design. Even even if it's yeah. not a conscious design, yeah. it is because yeah. the Bible is in in the United States by and large the product of the bourgeoisie. And well, and, sorry, can I just interject here? Because it, it, it reminds me, um, and I hope you can see the, the comparison here, but, you know, so I've worked in biblical studies for, for a really long time, and then I started working on on uh, the Moravian Brethren, which is, uh, uh, you know, 18th century German um, sect, I guess they were then, and now it's a, now it's a church, and they founded Bethlehem in, in, in um, Pennsylvania, and I guess Winston-Salem in, in, in North Carolina as well. Um, but uh, so they, uh, I started working with a lot of their stuff and, and was reading through some of the, the speeches from the, the leader of the community, and these were, you know, manuscripts, um, handwritten manuscripts, and that was to me much more foreign than the biblical texts ever were because the biblical texts have always you know you've they're already interpreted and consumed but before you even start i mean you're already you're stepping into a, a discourse i guess you would call it that that has already been established and fixed and that you just can't sort of step out of in a way and and so for 18th century texts to be much more foreign to me than biblical texts which are you know god knows how many uh millennia older is was actually quite a revelation to me in terms of sort of the estrangement that you meet with texts yeah and, and before we move forward you know if you're a listener and you listen and you're like well i don't know all the class analysis of all those different contexts that the the scriptures were produced and guess what neither do i you know neither mm. does chris and that is why we have christina here right mm. there are people <laughs> but christina with, has the answers <laughs> there are people i think christina uh, you know is one of the few but there are few there are others who are equipped with historical materialism, Marxist class analysis. And they are, they're doing these kinds of studies of these original contexts. And so we go to them to understand the original context from a Marxist lens. But I'll also say, you don't need to wait to read all of the um, the Marxist analyses of the you know original context to do a creative interpretation for particular class interests. And that's what Chris and I are starting to do with our mm. Bible in red, right? Mm. Every text we read, we don't know all of the class struggle, uh, you know, all the particular conditions and contradictions of that time. But we're, we are developing some, our own revolutionary class consciousness. And so we can be creative with our interpretation. Sounds pretty good to me. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a journey of joy reading the Bible mm. and, and becoming more and more aware of what's really going on. I think it's exciting. It's one of the reasons yeah. why I still read the Bible. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. Christina, you brought up Isaiah earlier. I'm sorry. We're going to have to edit that part out because I said the wrong book of the Bible. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Christina, you brought up the book of Acts earlier. People often lift up Acts as an example of how the early Christians were actually communists. You know, they were they were actually the real communists. How How is it that this early Christian communism of consumption is actually dependent upon exploitation so we're talking about that verse like and they shared all things in common mm, um, mm. why why is this picture not as rosy as it might first appear right yes so um this is actually a point taken from Rosa Luxemburg that the community in acts they only uh, consume they don't uh, they don't produce so um they they live off the wealth produced elsewhere and in the Greco-Roman world, that would be presumably off slavery. Um, and she also points out that this might have been a revolutionary practice within the community, but without an impact on the overall economic structure. And in one of your other podcasts, and I can't remember um, which one it was, but one of your guests made a remark about social democracy. 
how um, how its egalitarian focus is internal and not uh, within set within the world at large, so that the wealth that enables this kind of welfare in like in Denmark where I come from can come from exploitation, you know, like taxes from companies who make their goods in Bangladesh, for example, and uh, and so the wealth that is consumed by the community in an egalitarian manner is actually produced elsewhere, and 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 so this is a, I think this would be an important point for for any sort of future um sort of to think about how where the wealth comes from that that we might redistribute in any way um to ensure that that doesn't arise out of exploitation. Yeah, I think a lot of Christian socialists, Christian communists, Christian Marxists who who are just getting into the the study, we we all come across it, right? We read mm. Acts, we're like, oh, they shared all things in common. Wow, that's so radical. That's revolutionary. Um, mm. We should do that too. I think that's a tendency I, we see a lot. And yeah, I think that's really important to think about, well, internally, how were they organized? And we understand that it was a communism of consumption, not of production. Mm. And this is why, um, you know, these are two very different kinds of communism. There's a communism of sharing, which is very good, but we're trying to change class structures, which has to deal with uh, production. And so mm. that, I think that was a great point. And I definitely want to engage that text by Luxembourg. Maybe we'll do that for a uh, bonus episode sometime soon. Um, mm. But another another big question, I think, on the minds of people who are both Christian and Marxist is the question of Marx's take on religion. So Marx seems to have believed that religion solely serves to justify or mystify the material uh, exploitative relations of a given class society. So, I mean, would you say that you agree or disagree with him and why? Mm, yeah, so uh, this question always makes me sort of anxious. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, it, it does that because um, I am not a religious person. Uh, and I know that this is a very, very uh, important issue for for many people. And so it's one that I always try to sort of uh, um, negotiate sort of in a way. So in order to talk myself into answering the question, I think I, I would like to begin with a recent re review I did of a book by a professor of theology at Yale University on Protestantism and the new spirit of capitalism. So a sort of a quip on on Max Weber. Um, and in this book, the point was that um, a turn to Christ would break the spell of capitalism and also break with the self-understanding that capitalism urges us uh, to appropriate. And so um, but didn't offer any sort of suggestions as to how sort of any there was sort of no scope for revolution or reform or anything. And so I think presented with such a form of Christianity, I I would say, yes, well, this does serve to, you know, justify or mystify exploitative relations. But there are other forms of Christianity out there and um, and there are forms that aim to materially transform this world. And so Marx also called religion, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions, which, you know, I just find so incredibly poetic. Um, and and I think uh, I think I've sort of, that's something I sort of I, I, I think a lot about. And, and, and for me, it's a question of of which place religion has in the world and and what role it plays. And I mean, there's no denying that religion has served some pretty nefarious purposes and 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 the form it takes in in liberal societies really cements the individualism which i find so objectionable objectionable and chris you were talking about that earlier and and um i mean there are times when i even wonder whether we're past the heart of a heartless world role i mean that is you know the the, the world has just become so you know completely fragmented but i mean when it when it all comes to the crunch, anyone who's willing to change this world, whether it be for this worldly purpose or an otherworldly reward, I mean, who am I to, to say no to anyone who uh, who uh, who will want to go there? I mean, religion. That's that's why Chris and I are in it. You know, we're, yeah, we're trying yeah. to build up that yeah. <laughs> big old fortune. Give me that heavenly yes. reward. 
And so, you know, I mean, religion has acted as a powerful motivator for social change in the past. And and, I mean, in cultures where the communal fabric hasn't completely disappeared, maybe maybe it still can. Um, Did you see what I did there? I uh, walked that tightrope really well. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think that's cool. I think I, I would definitely agree with you in that for a lot of religion, religion attempts to be science and it attempts to be philosophy. And part of that is because historically religion, science and philosophy were welded together. And then we have this thing Mm. called the enlightenment and they start to Mm. be stripped apart. And so today in a very modern world, I mean, we're hundreds of years into the enlightenment and, you know, Chris and I, we've actually mentioned how there's actually a challenge for many modern people. It's interesting. We're actually trying to be religious for, for you know some people, uh, and, and and that's an interesting kind of complex situation and, and and problem that people are responding to in different ways. And so yeah, for me, I I do think that primarily religion is serving to justify the violence mm-hmm. or mystify, kind of uh, mm-hmm. to distort it, to hide it, to to confuse our our materialist analysis. But on the other hand, I don't think it has to be. I do think it's a form of idealism and, and it always will be it's not a science but it mm. should be subjected to our revolutionary uh materialist marxist leninist maoist analysis of yep. what's happening why um and what needs to be done yeah exactly and that's that's what i meant as uh, you know it's just a question of of giving it the right role um I, I like that phrase i don't think i've used that before but i'm going to start using that to the importance of understanding the proper role that religion can play in yep revolutionary struggles exactly yeah we've been trying to answer this question for a while now so chase and i bring it up any chance we get the thing we keep coming back to is well if it's bad can we abolish it no (laughs) people are still (laughs) going to practice it Mm. can it be anything other than evil and destructive and on the side of the bourgeoisie yeah i think so (laughs) and that's the best we got and part of the reason why we're having this conversation, right, because we think that biblical studies, the field of biblical studies, and then just the broader interpretation that's happening across billions of people, uh, you know, across the world right now, even in, you know, in this particular one religion, um, that it is a site of class struggle. And so mm-hmm. we can't back away from it. We can't just let the bourgeoisie or the colonizers or the imperialists have it to their will. Um, but we need to seize it for ourselves and the people need to be developed to consciously seize it for themselves and their own class interests. So. Yeah. And biblical studies can be so helpful in that because it can give, um, it can give a, a insight into a world before capitalism and before liberalism and sort of give us an insight into how the world can be organized and thought differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Really well put. So towards the end of your essay, you identify the field of biblical studies as a site of class struggle. Help us understand how contemporary capitalist and liberal ideology serves bourgeois interest through the field of biblical studies. I think a, a one word answer would be individualism, which, you know, Chris, you, you also mentioned earlier. And, and um, by this, I mean not only focusing on individual characters like we've also talked about in, in the Bible, but also also the theories of interpretation, uh, which targets the individual reader. Again, taking us back to what you were saying, Chris, but, you know, post-structuralist theory has given rise to to so many reading positions which are radically individualized. Um, and the meaning of the biblical text sort of grows out of the encounter between me and the text. And I think we see the effects of this in the many Bibles that are produced to address this individualized market. All of these are are, you know, no doubt efforts at making the Bible relevant for or across genders, sexualities, ages and racial identities. But but I think it also really has the effect of shutting down dialogue between these groups and fragmenting further um, some very fragmented societies. Well, Christine, I just want to say it's been a complete honor to be able to speak with you. Loved your essay. Again, uh, folks will plug it in the show notes. Go read it. Share it with your friends at church. Get it in your pastor's desk. And then, uh, oh, yeah, seminary friends as well. Maybe mm. maybe you'll want to do a little group study on this text. 
So uh, again, really appreciate your work that you've shared with us. And to wrap this up, if biblical studies, right, as we've talked for this last hour, is a site of class struggle, then perhaps biblical studies and interpretation can become a class weapon of the proletariat and of predominantly already Christian colonized nations. So do you think biblical study and interpretation can be wielded as a weapon of exploited classes? If not, why? If so, where have you seen this happen? Um, well, at one level, no. I don't think any academic discipline can. Academics have too many vested interests, and there just is such a separation between the the intelligentsia as a whole and the exploited classes. And I mean, this is really not to say that there aren't individual scholars who are very active anti-capitalist and who do really, really good work. But as a as a whole, as an institutionalized discipline, there is just too much at stake. And and the university really is, um, in spite of all the sort of shakeups and stuff through economic reform and, and, and so on, the university is a very conservative institution. But that's, you know, unfair to put biblical studies as an academic discipline because, you know, what you guys are doing is also biblical studies. And so at that very different level, sort of community outreach level, I, I would definitely see a, a bigger potential for a, a thorough shakeup because, you know, religion, as we know, really can mobilize an enormous amount of emotion and sort of direct it in a very targeted way. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the, and I'm just sort of taking from my own sort of European background, but the peasants wars in the, you know, in the, um, around the Reformation time in Germany in the, in the 16th century, which was, you know, absolutely massive social upheaval with uh, Thomas Munzer and leading the way, uh, the peasants into a, an armed revolt. Um, for example, and sort of using the Bible as as a way of inflaming sort of you know emotions and and getting people sort of real excited and things. So so I think that is a very good example. I, I mean I don't I I suspect it would probably be different in the U.S. But in a country like Denmark, which is sort of so northern European, I mean I don't think religion could ever mobilize anything anymore. Um, it simply does not have that sort of collective communal. Um, oomph to it that would that would uh, be able to generate anything at all. And Chris, you were saying with the community, the community focus that really is something that that you know so many Western societies just simply lack at a at a larger level. Um, so I was just shooting off everywhere there. Did I answer it sort of coherently in any sense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, definitely want to make clear that. Yeah, the scriptures is not something to be taken into communities that aren't Christian, right? We're not interested in proselytizing anyone. Um, but if a community is deeply uh, associated and, and kind of collectively has this Christian identity, I mean, you know, maybe everyone might not even go to church. Uh, mm. Chris, you've mentioned how, you know, some communities here in the U.S., um, not everyone might go to church, but everyone's well, has a sister or a brother or a, um, a mother or uh, you know a best friend who is involved in the church and so we can either allow biblical interpretation to be uh, produced class blindly mm. or explicitly for <laughs> the interests of capitalists and especially u.s imperialism here in the u.s yeah um, or we can consciously produce biblical interpretation and engage the bible Knowing that we are a world organized by class, mm. by gender, race, nationality, right? And that these uh, interests need to be struggled through. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I heard was your distinction between the field of biblical studies, the academic discipline, mm. and the things that the people can do with the Bible. Um, that's exciting to me. I'm not so much interested in the field of biblical studies at this point in my life. But I do think, and this conversation has really lifted that up, there's possibility. There are tools mm. in, in the scriptures that we can use. Um, Definitely. Yeah. We'll see if we will. Yeah, Christina, again, thank you so much for coming on, chatting with us. Uh, this has been an absolute blast. It really has. Thank for me as well. Cool.
right, Chris. Yeah. So uh, what would you think of that conversation? I had a great time. I think Christina brought it. Absolutely. And I think it's a really cool essay, um, especially the latter half. And um, but overall, you know, her project is, again, such a needed intervention into the field of biblical studies. And I really hope that people check it out. Um, But, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, we wanted to name uh, really briefly kind of what we loved about this text and then also um, name some important critiques that we find uh, particularly uh, uh, crucial. So, you know, we find that the latter half of this long essay to be a necessary intervention for biblical studies and that Peterson emphasizes the importance of Marxist political economy and historical materialism for understanding the original context and historical interpretations of scripture and identifies biblical studies and interpretation as a site for class struggle. And concerning the first half, we understand Christina to correctly stress comprehension of the particular political ideology or Marxist tendency shaping the theorist's analysis and interpretation. And you'll get that when you read this. The the first section is all about, okay, here's what Marxism means, and you need to understand this before you can understand the rest of it. She also gets right the acknowledgement of the general ignorance of the historical development of revolutionary Marxist theory and practice among biblical scholars and theologians. And three, she recognizes how the history of class struggle under capitalism, in particular the two communist revolutions or the world historical revolutions across the world and internal to the communist movement have fundamentally shaped the development of biblical studies. Absolutely, yeah. All that stuff we really, really found so important and powerful. Um, However, you know, we do believe that Christina wrongly subscribes to what we, from a Marxist-Leninist Maoist perspective, would call modern revisionism that does support China's social imperialism um, explicitly in the text and rejects the Maoist development of and rupture from Leninism and thus the contemporary communist revolutions being waged today in the Philippines and in India. And um, this ideological uh, struggle, you know, it's not superfluous. It's not extra. These have material implications for how we understand class and who is in power in a particular nation. And also how places without proletarian democracies or dictatorships of the proletariat uh, should wage their struggles for socialism and national liberation. So again, I think Chris, myself, and Christina, we would all agree on the importance of ideological struggle uh, between the various forms of Marxisms, but Chris and I would definitely uh, believe that Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is the third and highest stage of revolutionary science. Yeah, and it, it is it is critical to continue the struggle, even with friends of ours like Christina, who wrote a really incredible article that is still so helpful to our understanding. And we had a great time having this conversation with him. Right on. All right, friends. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Share it with your seminary and church friends, and we will talk soon.